My name is Eleni Hadzi. I'm the Chair of Structural Mechanics and the Monitoring uh, here in the Department of uh, Civil, Environmental and Geomatic Engineering at ETH. And I'm also a member of the ETH AI Center. Uh, something to know about me is that I'm naturally curious, which is probably what pushed me to become a researcher in the first place. And uh, when I'm not in the office or in the lab, I'm enjoying travel with my husband and friends, and you might likely find me solving riddles in an escape room. So as the name of the group reveals, uh, Structural Mechanics and Monitoring, there is a dual element in my research. It combines first principles that come from mechanics with data that come from monitoring. And so this data we um, extract from sensors that we deploy on structural systems, even large-scale structures such as bridges, and which convey different and diverse information regarding the response of these structures, which is what we use to interpret their health, or in other words, their condition. And this is the concept of structural health monitoring. But you might ask, why do we monitor structures in the first place? And this would be a reasonable question, because to most of us, structures are just bulky, uh, static objects that do not move. Contrary to popular belief, structures are actually living and breathing organisms, they experience aging and deterioration, they experience injury, and they interact with their environments, and in fact, they move. Uh, as a result of the extreme loads that they are exposed to, they are actually subjected to damage. And this exposure to damage is something that can impair our economic, economic and societal structures because uh, our, our infrastructure systems are carrying, they are the hosts of our mobility and energy uh, networks, and at rare and unfortunate events, they might even be connected to fatalities, so to loss of human lives. So in order to safeguard and protect structural systems, as mentioned, we work in this, with this principle of structural health monitoring, which in essence forms actually a chain. And the very first link in this chain is the gathering of the data itself. And as I mentioned before, there's many ways to do this today. There exist technologies that allow us to deploy sensors quite densely across large-scale structural systems and we can convey a diversity of information, including information on acceleration, displacement, in general response uh, quantities of the structures. We can, we can extract information about their environments, such as temperature, the operating wind, in case we're monitoring a wind turbine. And we can even have sensors that have embedded intelligence. So we can have AI on a chip, which means we can even have processing modalities within the sensors themselves. Data on its own is, of course, not enough. The very second link of this uh, SHM chain is the combination of engineering models. As engineers are aware, models are essentially giving us the power to, to introduce our knowledge of the system into the way in which we simulate it. And so in our case, in the case of structural health monitoring, we primarily, primarily rely on knowledge of the underlying mechanics and dynamics of these uh, systems. Now, the combination, the fusion of data and models is what is often referred to as hybrid modeling, which is something we are using. And we also often refer to it as virtualization because it's a way to virtualize actual systems through the delivery of a digital representation, a digital twin. We can use the information that is generated from the fusion of data and models into this third link of the SHM chain, which is the task of extracting quantifiable indicators of the performance of the system. Artificial intelligence and machine learning play a huge role in this step because they deliver the diagnostic and prognostic uh, tools for uh, essentially quant quantifying the condition of the system, which is our first uh, aim. Now, as we move on to the final link of the SHM chain, we want to use the information that we extract from the few scarce uh, components or items that we monitor within a large network to be able to deliver support for the decisions on the optimal management and operation at the level of the system. And so when we refer to the level of the system for infrastructure, you can imagine the set of bridges and tunnels that form part of a roadway network. You can imagine the set of wind turbines that are part of a wind farm, or even the portfolio of wind farms uh, that, are, uh, that you would find across the North Sea. So we would like um, our assessment to extrapolate to this kind of uh, uh, network or population uh, level. In a way, this SHM chain is a perfect parallel to artificial intelligence itself, which forms, a, um, essentially comprises three uh, core concepts, data, uh, computing capabilities, and of course, algorithms. And this is precisely the logic that is followed also in the SHM chain. 
we use this SHM chain, every link of which is affected by the use of AI and machine learning tools in order to shift our common or typical approach towards infrastructure from a passive and inanimate one to one that regards infrastructure systems as active or rather animate. So we do this in three steps through sensing. We bestow structural systems with perception, the ability to sense what is around them. Through the fusion of knowledge that comes from physics and models, we make them cognitive. So we make them capable of extracting processed knowledge. And finally, by using uh, the uh, machine learning tools for diagnostics and prognostics, we make the systems uh, to the degree feasible autonomous in the sense that they can sense faults or damage into the system and possibly um, alarm or trigger for the reaction. As a very final thought, if you think about this concept of learning from populations, a system learns from its peers and suddenly becomes a self-aware unit within a large system, which is the a culture or approach we want to cultivate for treating structural systems. In trying to implement this end-to-end -end vision, we are naturally faced with challenges, and the very first one comes from the aspect of gathering data itself. Um, for this, we have to get our hands dirty and actually go out to the field where structures are operating. We have had a number of projects that required us to travel the world for instrumented, instrumenting bridges or testing them to failure, as for example in Iceland, where we collaborated with the Icelandic authorities. We actually own, uh, as a group, a wind turbine structure, which is located in Winterthur and where we generate data for uh, research purposes. And additionally, uh, what plays a big role for us is also experimentation within a laboratory environment. So this is why we're here today in the uh, Structures Lab of the Institute of Structural Engineering. And you see behind me the Hexapod device, which is a new asset for our group. Uh, it allows us to uh, perform experimentation, which uh, offers us the possibility to observe phenomena that are actually rarely occurring uh, in, uh, under a real setting, but that are very important to understand and analyze. For example, we can bring the support element of a, bridge, of a bridge structure, such as bearings, and we can place them on this dynamic testing facility in order to understand how these would perform under extreme loads, such as earthquakes, and better understand how monitoring solutions could help us uh, uh, protect these systems under extreme events. This collected data, which was the first step, is on its own very uh, valuable. We have found, for instance, that by collecting data from few wind turbines within a wind farm, we can actually predict the damage evolution within the entire farm, so all of the components, under varying conditions of the, uh, of, of the wind speed, uh, maybe the wind direction, the turbulence that is uh, dominant on the site. And this is, of course, a very quantifiable metric for engineers to use for the assessment of these systems. A step further, using uh, artificial intelligence and techniques like uh, conditional variational autoencoders, we have found that we can describe interactions, physical interactions within the wind farm, such as the wake phenomenon, which uh, if we attempted to model, would require a number of assumptions and would never perfectly reflect the true situation that we have in a specific uh, wind site. So in a sense, data can allow us to infer relationships that move beyond the potential of certain modeling approaches. But while availability of data is a potent tool, it actually never suffices on its own. Imagine instrumenting a bridge structure, for instance, using a limited number of sensors, because this is necessary due to budget constraints. We know at this point, based on our research, that we can relatively easily diagnose damage on the system. So basically, we can pick up that something might be off, an anomaly that arises in the system. Many machine learning uh, methods are, exist and are available and are proven robust to, uh, to satisfy such a task. One step further, we even could claim that if we have placed our sensors in a carefully selected manner onto the bridge, we could even try to locate where the damage might be happening. But the moment you want to go uh, beyond this kind of diagnostic assessment and you want to pursue prognosis, so for example, the moment you wish to understand what is the remaining useful life of this bridge, you need to bring physics and some type of model into the loop. But the fusion of data with models comes with its own set of grand challenges. First, we want to make sure that our models are computationally affordable. And we need this for diagnostic tasks that have to be um, carried out on the fly, uh, meaning as data is attained, uh, which is relevant for control. It is all also relevant for us in the context of hybrid testing. I gave you earlier the example of testing a bearing on the hexapod device, for example, and when you do this, 
as I said, you need to bring the real actions into the lab. So we need to simulate the loads that would be exerted by an actual bridge, which means that this bridge needs to live in a numerical model. It has to be simulated. But of course, these kinds of engineering models are usually quite detailed, quite complex, and could take hours or even days to compute. In our case, we need the computation to be in a fraction of seconds because it has to be combined with dynamic testing. In order to achieve this kind of efficiency, uh, we develop methods that reduce computational models. We do this in various ways. Uh, on one hand, we fo follow physics approaches for reduction by changing the resolution at which we examine systems. This is done with substructuring or multi-scale methods, or we use machine learning to develop surrogates, fast, reduced representations of uh, dynamic response um, that can uh, replace our detailed finite element model. We also are able to express the dependence of these models on the parameters that are influencing them, such as their operating environments, uh, maybe traffic loads on a bridge or the wind on a wind turbine, and of course, in environmental conditions like the temperature or humidity. We can do this using projection on manifolds or other um, uh, methods that uh, express dependence. And we're also able to, or rather are forced to, account for uncertainty. Uh, and uncertainty can be tackled using uh, variational approaches or uh, Bayesian tools that can allow us to reflect um, uh, the confidence that we have in our predictions. Now, why is it necessary to model uncertainty? Uh, it is not only because of the fact that data is never perfect, it is additionally because of the fact that a model is never perfect. In order to construct our models, we do a number of assumptions and approximations. I even said we have to reduce them so they're even more uh, simplified in their representation. Uh, therefore, we need to account for the fact that there's modeling error. But what we argue is that the fusion of these models, even if imperfect, is necessary for us in order to instill some knowledge and structure into the data-driven predictions. And we have found that this is indeed the case in our more, uh, recent, in the most recent work on physics-guided uh, deep learning methods for uh, modeling of nonlinear systems. We show how you can merge imperfect models with data to obtain the best of both worlds. A field where we have already implemented some of these uh, ideas and methods into practice is the field of monitoring for wind energy infrastructure. This forms a, a result of a, of a long project, an ERC starting grant of the monitoring of wind turbine facilities, and the development of smart and data-driven methods uh, for extending their remaining useful life. We have developed a number of approaches that can quantify the uh, types of damage that can be experienced by these systems, fatigue being a primary such example of damage, and we have developed proof of concept tools that are now packaged into solutions which we would like to uh, spin off uh, into a new uh, company that will draw a basis from this uh, initiating uh, project. So here it is important to additionally note that while monitoring is often met in the context of industrial components and assets, it is more rarely met for large-scale civil engineering structures. And the reason for, the, for this, or one of the reasons for this, is that each structure is, of course, unique. So uh, there is a field that perhaps we need customized solutions, which to some degree is true, but now we know we can solve through monitoring. But on the other hand, there is also skepticism by many of the more traditional uh, civil engineering um, authorities, which regard the data-driven type of assessment something relatively new and not ne necessarily interpretable. To change this stance, there is two things we can do. On one hand, we can deliver tools that are interpretable for engineers, and we know that we can uh, now do this. And additionally, we need to push for an interdisciplinary culture in our educational system, which is why I'm happy to form part of the ETH AI Center, where interdisciplinarity is pursued across levels, from faculty to students to all researchers involved. In parallel, also here in our department, uh, we have a new initiative the Data Science and Machine Learning Initiative, which was originated from my colleague Olga Fink, and which gives the opportunity to civil engineers to be exposed to the idea of data, uh, to the analysis of data, and the principles of data science. We already can see some change in culture, and we are discovering this through our engagement and collaboration with authorities, which are now more open to the implementation of these ideas in practice. One example of such an exchange and collaboration with authorities is our partnership with the uh, Swiss Federal Railways, where we work on onboard monitoring solutions. So basically, 
uh, placing sensors on vehicles that traverse kilometers of infrastructure and are able to extract indicators of the performance of this uh, extended system at the network level. I have so far described a, a vision for embodying intelligence within structural systems from cradle to grave, meaning from the beginning of their life cycle all the way to the end. Looking ahead, we would like to make sure that we render structures indeed sensible. Within the Alive initiative at ETH Zurich, I form part of an interdisciplinary team of engineers, architects, biologists, and material scientists working on ways to engineer uh, living materials, which comes all the way to the infrastructural scale. I'm particularly, particularly leading a work package uh, that deals on the development of self-sensing and self-healing materials. This means that by using biological organisms, such as, for example, bacteria or fungi, we will be able to create materials that are hosted within classical structural materials like concrete or wood, but that are bestowed with the ability to self-sense their deformability, to self-sense change in their environment, and also instigate, uh, activate processes for self-healing through carbonation or hydration. So we're in this case truly discussing self-aware infrastructures where truly big data, big streams of data would be constantly generated across a very dense network of monitor structures. And here AI will play a critical role for, role for deciphering uh, the conditions of these extended infrastructure systems. We'll be able to use methods that are based on population learning for better uh, grasping knowledge and understanding our, uh, the world around us. In closing, I would like to uh, invite you to imagine with me a world where uh, structures are not just passive receptors of our action. They're actually living and breathing organisms that are able to adapt and change uh, based on their environments. Imagine airplanes that are self-aware and are able to self-heal during flight conditions or bridges that can sense impairment due to corrosion and activate their healing. Let's imagine and build a world that is animate.